Hi everyone, I'm Fatima Goss Graves. I'm president and CEO of the National Women's Law Center and also co-founder of the Times Up Legal Defense Fund. And at the National Women's Law Center and Times Up Legal Defense Fund are really proud to bring you this webinar series that focuses on black women survivors of workplace sexual harassment and sexual violence. You know, in this work, we are deeply committed to lifting up the voices and centering the experiences of Black women in all of our work, but specifically at the work at the Times Up Legal Defense Fund, we're able to track our data and know that 16% of the people who come to us requesting legal help are Black, and nearly 40% are women of color. And therefore, it's even more important for the attorneys that are collaborating with us as volunteers, and we are so grateful for all of you. It's even more important that they each have a firm grounding in the many ways in which sexual violence impacts Black women and the ways in which we can most effectively support and advocate for Black women survivors. You know, the attorneys who have showed up and volunteered for the Legal Network for Gender Equity, we are so grateful for all you do every day to combat sex discrimination, including sexual harassment in the workplace, and for taking the time out of your schedules to learn more deeply about this critical topic. And we also want to say a huge thank you to our excellent presenters who you will hear from shortly, but also to Girls for Gender Equity and the National Black Worker Center Project, our partners in this series for their time and their substantive contributions in developing it. And I won't take all the time uh, to describe the many, many accomplishments from the experts you are about to hear from shortly, uh, but I do encourage you to look them up in more detail afterwards. Uh, and our speaker list, including brief biographies, are gonna be available to all participants, along with other supplemental materials that we are gonna send out. We also are going to be sure that we make time for questions at the end of the webinar. A few reminders before we get started that are good housekeeping rules during our presentations. We're gonna ask all of you to keep your devices on mute so that we can all hear the speakers. And you can send questions and comments to presenters by using the chat function to the right of your screens on the webinar platform. And we will do our very best to address those questions and any other ones we get at the end of the webinar. But I will not take more time because what I really, really want to do is turn it over to our colleagues. And again, a huge thank you to all for participating in the webinar, for showing up for Black women, and especially Black women who are survivors in this work. And with that, I now will turn it over to Tanya Lovelace and Carmen Cotton. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tanya Lovelace, and I'm the CEO for Women of Color Network, Inc., and I am really grateful to be a part of this webinar um, and looking forward to hearing uh, the amazing presentations that will occur today. I have the wonderful uh, fortune of being able to summarize amazing words from my brilliant colleagues, Lumi Hankins and Jerry Boo. You know, along with sharing some of the points from my presentation as well, from the webinar that took place last Thursday, February 27th. So I look forward to just giving you some thoughts as we move into the second portion of this amazing webinar series. So if we can please go to the next slide. And Tanya, thank you very much. Um, this is Umi Hankins, the moderator. We're getting a lot of feedback, and so I just want you to be aware of that, and we're working on that to correct that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Umi. Um, and uh, do let me know if you need me to pause at any point. So okay. I'm going to make this very quick so that we can get on to the new, to the additional presentations that will be happening today. And so last Thursday, Jerry Boo Hill started a, us off with such an amazing presentation. And some of the 
points that she made with us. The first quote that I wanna share is that she stated that history and context tell a story of body as property, body and bondage and for the taking. And that phrase really struck me and I think the audience very deeply. And she, then she went on to speak about the ongoing, she spoke about the ongoing experiences for black women within the slavery institution of rampant rapes, of sexual assault, harassment, and the, um, and the beating of black women, how black families were sold off and destroyed, no protections and no say over their bodies. Please go to the next slide. Can you please go to the next slide? And so she went on to say, though, that there had always been resistance among black women. And from 1619 and the enslavement of, um, of black people to domestic workers in the 21st century, domestic black women have resisted. And then she stated that to come full circle now, you now see that there is hashtag me too that was essentially developed for black and brown girls, but has been used now become a clarion cry across the movement for all women and how so many other movements have moved forward to help us step into this process of moving and ending violence. So Jerry Boo had great information and she will share more today. Can you please pass it to the next slide? And so then Umi Hankins, who is the, um, who has the dual role of um, both pre presenting in different spaces um, on this webinar, as well as being the moderator of the webinar, she also had sage information for us. She stated that every ounce of our bodies are impacted by our intersecting identities all at once or at all once. And so she stated that Black women can have both points of privilege and oppression, but the oppression they experience is generally lessened by that privilege. And so access does not mean that we are sitting in the same place as all others who have access. It does mean that it's then mitigated by other factors, by being Black women and by our class as well that can impact that. And that young Black women experience more sexual harassment in the workplace and that the data disproportionately demonstrates this for Black women and girls alike. Can you please pass this, pass to the next slide? Please pass to the next, yes. Uh, can you go back one, I'm sorry. There should be one more. There should have been a slide before that, I'm so sorry. Okay, so it looks like there's only, for some reason, only one slide for Umi. Let's uh, continue to me, thank you. And so then the points that I shared is that in times of language policing, please include words um, that black women use to describe their experience. And some of the words that we use that have been challenged and again, have been policed are words like racism, sexism, transphobia. Um, these are statements that should be used when talking about sexual assault, harassment and rape when, it, when it's specific to our experiences. And also, we talked uh, briefly about not using just the term slaves, which that in and of itself is a dehumanizing um, term, but to really look at the people, enslaved Africans. My last slide, and then we'll move on. And what I stated is that being in the Constitution as three-fifths of a human being set the legal justification, the legal justification for dehumanization and, object and objectification. And so I encourage you to look up, uh, to watch the previous webinar, to see the four historical caricatures that have been used since slavery, um, from the, since the slavery institution, um, as a way to undervalue and to justify sexual assault, because those contexts, that context is still in the workplace for us today. And that there are studies that show that eye tracking and implicit bias is still imprinted on um, within the minds of those who objectify black women by looking at our bodies in a very different way. Um, our bodies are disproportionately sexualized and associated by with animals. And so I just wanted to share those pieces and I will pass it to Karma to do 
uh, to summarize the rest of the uh, webinar from last week. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you to um, the National Women's Law Center and um, to our colleagues for what was an incredible um, presentation last week, and we're all looking forward to our panel discussion this afternoon. I have the pleasure of uh, being able to summarize um, the final portion of our, our uh, panel discussion last week, which really focused on um, the content and context of sexual assault, and um, then moved into a couple of discussions around what does um, justice truly look like for black women, and finally, what does being an ally mean? And so, Condencia Braid, the executive director of the National Organization of Sisters of Color Ending Sexual Assault, started us off with the ideas around the context of sexual assault and sexual harassment, and particularly the importance of understanding that sexual harassment is one form of sexual assault. And that as we look at the occurrence of sexual assault in the black community, that the narratives of the strong black woman, the angry black woman, and the sexualized black woman all um, impact on a survivor's ability to heal. And that as we begin to think about the context of sexual assault and sexual harassment, it's really incredible. It's really important for us to also then understand black women and the impact of trauma. And that um, she shared an important quote that trauma is cumulative. The more traumas people experience, the more traumatized they become. And that that is particularly important for black women. And that for black women, the history of collective community trauma lives in our bodies. And so does the trauma associated with the experiences of sexual assault. And as Ms. Bray continued into the conversation, she also highlighted the importance of understanding the resiliency of black women, that our, resi our resiliency is incredibly important, it's a part of our strength, and that for many of us, we consider ourselves survivors as well as victims. And so that survivorship is a critical component of our daily lives. And then she left us with a, with a lasting thought, that for black women to engage in the act of loving themselves fully in a society that deems them and their labor disposable is both countercultural and revolutionary. We moved into a, a, a conversation around really what does um, justice look like and how do stereotypes reinforce the objectification and dehumanization of black women and girls? And particularly thinking about how bias shows up and that studies have shown that black women have been considered sexualized from the context of how people look at their bodies and particularly how there's fixation on the sexualized body regions of black women. And that black women have been strongly, that they're more strongly implicitly associated with animals and object concepts, which then leads to this dehumanization of black women, and particularly the idea that black women are unrapeable and unable to be actually harassed in the workplace or in general. And finally, we talked about two, these two last things around what does justice look like for black women survivors, and particularly talking through restorative justice and how doing our research and taking into account historical trauma when we consider remedies for black women is critical. And that doing the work to understand and include intersectionality is, in, is also critical to ensuring that women have, black women in particular, have access to justice. And finally, as we talk about allyship, understanding that being an ally it means that you have a responsibility to learn uh, and that it's not the responsibility of those of mar from marginalized communities to teach. That allyship is a lifelong process of building relationships that's built on trust and consistency. And that critically important to understand is that you are not, being an ally is not a self-identified or self-defined state, that the work and efforts have to be recognized and must be recognized by those who you are seeking to ally with. And finally, one of the last quotes that um, we talked through and that was shared during our presentation was this idea that seeing our humanity as black women, believing our stories and claims, and trusting the voices and experiences of black women is critical to ensuring that we have the resources, that there is accountability, and reaching true allyship. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, um, Karma Kotman. And I want to uh, let you know that um, Karma Kotman is the executive director of UGMA, the National Center on Violence Against Women in the Black Community. And thank you very much, Tanya Lovelace. And Tanya Lovelace is the CEO of Women of Color Network. And I am Umi Hankins, and I am the executive director and president of the National Institute on Transformation and Healing. And I will be helping to moderate our uh, webinar today and helping us just to transition as we go from one portion to another. So I want to remind you that this is part two of our webinar series. So the summary that you just heard summarized part one on representing black women survivors of workplace sexual harassment and sexual violence. And so part two, we're looking at the litigation guidance and best practices as we do that work. So as we continue on with um, the information that we have, I'd like to now introduce um, Jaribu Pio. Jaribu, thank you very much. <laughs> I keep getting my <laughs> accent wrong on that. So I do apologize no for that. Um, and then also Kelly Butt. And Jaribu is um, the executive director of the Mississippi Workers Center for Human Rights. And her presentation will be followed by Kelly Budd. And Kelly Budd is an attorney partner with Dumar Martin. Um, so Jaribu, if you would can start your presentation, I'd appreciate it. Yes. Um, the title of my presentation is going to be Unpacking Race, Class, and Gender to Develop Winning legal strategies. And the reason why it's so important to embrace all three of the forms of oppression, and we often call it triple oppression, that black women and brown women, women of color face is because that whole range of rights, that whole range of relief would not be available if we did not unpack and demand that both race, class, and gender be looked at when we look at discrimination. While the center fights, I'm sorry, next slide. While the center fights for the rights of all low wage workers, its primary focus is on black women who suffer from what radical black women scholars call triple oppression. In workplaces where sexual harassment is pervasive and out of control, black women often are disproportionately targeted. The myths and stereotypes addressed in part one of this series inform the observations offered in this presentation. Next slide. It is not always appropriate to allege race and gender claims in the same legal action. However, where the evidence shows the harassment the plaintiff experienced was more severe when compared with harassment experienced by other women, particularly white women, an allegation of race discrimination would serve to identify the full range of abuse. It is important to allege race, gender, and class claims to graphically and accurately expose the extent to which various forms of discrimination are allowed to poison the work environment without any effective actions taken by management. In such zones of intolerance, it is for certain that all forms of hatred will rear their ugly heads, sexism, racism, homophobia, and transphobia would in these zones find a safe haven. Next slide. In a Title VII lawsuit filed against a popular restaurant chain, a black gay man who was called a fag ass nigger in front of customers prevailed on claims of race and sexual orientation discrimination. While it is true, gender discrimination often cuts across race and class lines, as in the case of SKN, a black woman who was sexually harassed by her black male female super male supervisor, I'm sorry, was forced to suffer in silence and endure the abuse. Power dynamics and a rank sense of disregard for SKN as a black woman who had limited educational opportunities and had always been left with few employment options. She stated, they thought I couldn't do any better. 
Next slide, please. Many real life stories shaped the center's mission and plan of action. In 2004, after receiving numerous complaints about sexual harassment and retaliation in a Mississippi auto manufacturing company, the center joined with survivors to launch a powerful education and advocacy campaign against workplace sexual harassment. At the violating company, Black women auto workers were constantly harassed, fondled, propositioned, and threatened with rape in their workplace. As a result of our advocacy campaign, women saw a reduction in incidents of sexual harassment. Freedom from all forms of harassment and abuse is also a human right. We look at the convention to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women, better known as CEDAW, and we happily announced once again the ILO Domestic Workers Convention, which led to the victory for domestic workers and putting their issues on the world stage. Know Your Rights trainings to put the power in the hands of the survivors, public awareness and corporate slash company shaming, legal advocacy, many eggs in a very large basket. What's the end game? Next slide, please. Levering best options. You must get to know your client, conduct an extensive intake interview. To get maximum relief and redress, it is important to carefully identify every possible cause of action. Next, identify every statutory protection available federal employment statutes and relevant authorities, Title VII, Section 1983, in the case of state action, state statutes and relevant authorities, dare to include, I'm sorry, next slide, going too fast. State statutes and relevant authorities, dare to include at the outset or amend the original complaint to include state claims, including but not limited to Neg negligent hiring. Yeah, neg although I've specifically asked to see the doctor. When is the doctor regularly? Supervision and training, negligent investigation, respondent superior, negligent infliction of emotional distress, civil assaults. Yeah, well, I need a review of my medication, so I guess I'll come in. Uh, excuse me, someone, I'm so sorry, Ms. Hill. Someone is um, talking during the presentation, so could you please make sure that all of the participants and staff are on mute. Thank you very much. Sorry, Ms. Hill. Okay, and I, I will just leave off with the ninth and 10th uh, strategy, intentional infliction of emotional distress. And then there are administrative regulations and agencies responsible for compliance and enforcement. For example, Office of Federal Contract Compliance. And we would call a case where when we were litigating against a very large company in Mississippi that the women at that very same plant also had filed an Office of Federal Contract Compliance complaint about being sexually harassed and being denied promotions. And the dozen or so women in that particular complaint actually prevailed and they were also part of the plaintiff's pool in our lawsuit. Next slide, please. Office of Federal Contract Compliance, a well-kept secret. Blocks, no witnesses, no case, not really an employee. These are some of the things that are said, that, that the uh, plaintiff is not really an employee. And so we have to unpack that. We have to understand what it means to be an employee. And we have to investigate beyond what the employer says about that, because it are, in the case of SKN, we learned early on that the employer's assessment and categorization of SKN was that she was not an employee, but in fact, she was a W-2 employee. And so that claim went out the window as far as them saying we had no cause of action as far as, as far as them contemplating a motion to dismiss that we had no cause of action because in fact, she was not a, an employee under the definition of, a, of an employee 
under Title VII. And of course, we were able to beat that back and we were able to prove them wrong. So never listen to the employer. Always do your own investigation, do your own legal research to discover how the definition of an, of an employee stacks up against the definition of a contract worker, issues of control, issues of whether or not the person actually controlled their time and their assignments and basically had no supervisor. Common defenses that we know exist are the ones where they will say, where the boss will say, we investigated and found nothing, therefore the harassment didn't happen. The conduct was welcomed. The conduct was not sexual in nature. First Amendment rights. The employer had valid business reasons for the adverse action. Harasser has mental issues, affirmative defenses. And look closely, those of you who are practicing in this area, look closely and remember both Supreme Court one and two of the Ellerith uh, cases. These are very important cases that will inform us and will lead to helping to develop strategies to address extremely severe measures that must be taken to protect women from employer liability for sexual harassment. And so there they talk about the perpetrator as the supervisor in Farragher versus City of Boca Raton and in Burlington Industries, Inc. versus Ellerith. These are two versions of the Ellerith case that need to be looked at when looking at affirmative defenses, when looking at liability that is actually assigned to supervisors in various districts and various circuits. Of course, it varies. And so it's important to know where you're located and know what that particular circuit provides in terms of protection and support. The center was established de December 30th, 1996 to provide organizing support, legal advocacy and education for low wage workers and their families. And it has been my pleasure to present this to you. We look forward to the conversation going forward. Thank you so much, Ms. Hill. Really appreciate that dynamic presentation and all of that information, a lot of uh, collective information regarding various cases that have gone forth regarding sexual harassment in the workplace. And Miss um, Bud, Kelly Bud, if you could start your presentation, please. Miss Bud, are you on mute? Kelly, can you hear us? I'm not sure if um, Kelly was disconnected, but while we check on that and see if we can get her back online, I'd like to move to our next presentation and we will then come back. So if we can move through her presentation and we're going to go to our next presentation, which will be um, representing Black Women Survivors, um, also by Ms. Butt. Okay, wait a minute. Oh, by Ms. Um, Condencia Braid. Let's go to that. Yeah. Uh, and Con Condencia, as was said before, is the Executive Director of the National Organization of Sisters of Color Ending Sexual Assault. And she will be talking about representing Black women survivors and how we advocate for them. Thank you very much, Condencia. Thank you. Thank you, Umi. Hello, everyone. It's so wonderful to be able to be a part of this um, amazing panel of, of women talking about such an important topic. Um, so as, as Umi said, I will be talking about um, representing Black women survivors. Next slide. For, it's, it's important, um, a survivor when a survivor comes to you for assistance, to know that for many Black women survivors of sexual harassment and other forms of sexual assault, telling someone and going forward to seek support or justice is a tremendous step. In fact, you may be the only person they have told about the incident. And so it's, it's 
remarkably important to remember that once they've come to you, take a moment to appreciate them and appreciate their efforts and validate how meaningful this is. Next slide. When representing black women survivors, know that survivors will be at different places in what they want to happen with their, with their case, with the incident, et cetera. It's important to ask survivor where they may need help and what kind of assistance they may need. For black women particularly, it's important to be engaging with and supporting black women survivors to identify and explore the full scope of remedies. Because of our lived experiences, black women may not expect much from the systems and from systems and may be thankful for whatever mini minimum we can get. Therefore, black women may not expect or consider certain remedies that other communities might. In your work with black women, it's so important to remember that her justice is not yours. So let her define what justice looks like for her without judgment. Next slide. Engaging with the legal system can be traumatic for any survivor, but given the systemic in a, in a, uh, inequalities for the black community, it's even more so and can be even more traumatic for black women. It's important to provide as much information about the process and what to expect as, as, as much as possible. Explain the process from beginning to end, even so much as showing her the space where if there's gonna be a hearing, where the hearing may take place or driving by the building. Important to role play the scenario if she will need to testify. Share any anticipated contact with the harm doer or perpetrator. Knowledge is power and can often address some level of anxiety, especially with a black woman who is already anxious about engaging with the legal system. This can help in providing some sense of control. In addition, for survivors, it's important to think about where your first meeting will be and as much as possible, look for spaces that will minimize chaos and provide some sense of comfort for the survivor. Depending on where the survivor is in the healing process, recognize that the survivor may disassociate with you during the meeting. It's important to repeat critical information or stress important points. It's also important to be as flexible as you can be with time, recognizing that you may need more time than other cases when working with a black woman survivor. And in fact, in working with many survivors of sexual assault. Also recognize that given the trauma associated with sexual assault, whenever a survivor is coming to engage with you, it is bringing up the trauma of the incident and perhaps past incidents right in front of them. So on the day of your meeting, your initial meeting or any of the meetings that you have with the survivor, they may call and cancel last minute or not show up. Be mindful of making judgments as a result of that. Particularly, and I say this particularly as it relates to black women, because often even those of us who have worked with survivors of sexual assault and understand trauma, when it comes to black women, our stereotypes rush us to judgment. So be mindful of that. Next slide. It's also important to be aware of and provide access to support services for survivors. Black women survivors need support while going through the process. As I said before, telling the story can be trauma, traumatic and triggering. Survivor may not feel, sometimes survivor may not feel anything or feel okay when meeting with you, but later when they go home, when they leave the meeting, there might be intruding thoughts, triggers, flashbacks can happen. We know that going through a, the, a case, it can, take an, it can take a significant amount of time before it's finalized. And therefore it's important to have support during that process. Someone who can advocate for and support that survivor throughout the process. Also survivors may have additional needs that is associated with dealing, addressing, uh, dealing with or addressing the incident. And it's helpful for you to be able to provide them a plethora of resources. It's important for you to know the community and support services so that you can offer those to the survivor. 
build relationships with sexual assault advocates that specifically works with the black community. And I cannot stress on that enough. We talked about earlier the trauma for black women. We talked about the historical context of black women, survivors and engaging with systems. It's important that you're working with an advocate that can understand, appreciate and respond to those differences for black women. And so I can't stress enough the importance of knowing your community and knowing where there are resources and support for black women. When working with a survivor, it's important to let the survivor know that you can have an, an advocate present. Make sure you know someone, you, you have some resources in the community that you can let the survivor know if they choose to want to have an advocate with them, you can provide that for them. Also let the survivor know that they can have an advocate present, that they can bring someone that they choose for support. At minimum, be, be able to give the contact information for a sexual assault advocate to the survivor. So they can leave with someone, with, with contact information for someone or a resource in case they need support after their meeting with you. Again, ensuring that this is someone who's worked with the black community and understand sexual assault. It's also important to recognize that domestic, when we're oftentimes, especially in communities of color, there can, all, there can be the equation of sexual assault and domestic violence. But sexual assault and domestic violence are not the same thing. Yes, there are some sexual assault survivors that have a history of intimate partner violence. And abusive sex can be used as a tool in an intimate partner in an intimate partner violence. But sexual assault is broad and include many forms of sexual violation. To ensure that we are effectively supporting survivors, it's important to be intentional in recognizing that supporting sexual assault survivors requires different approaches, resources, and response than domestic violence. Domestic violence and sexual assault are not the same thing. In addition, with the understanding of the complexities of sexual assault, you, it's, it's important to work with an organization that has a history of addressing sexual assault and has direct experience working with survivors of sexual assault. Agencies without this background can be harmful for survivors and can have unintended consequences. Next slide. It's in, know your community, as I said before, and the resources available for black women who are survivors of sexual assault. Identify and build collaborative relationships with culturally specific communities of color organizations that can provide direct support and services. Next slide. Culturally specific services for communities of color are at minimal culturally specific responses crafted specifically for that community. Culture specific communities of color organizations are specifically by and for a racial ethnic community and have a mission, leadership, staffing, and organizational approach that is steeped in and reflective of the racial ethnic community they serve. Oops. Culture specific services go beyond translation, and recognize the impact of historical trauma. It's inclusive of cultural ways of healing, as well as the language patterns and communication styles of the community. They go beyond, as I said, interpretation, translating information, or hiring a bilingual advocate. When working with cultures to the communities of color organizations, there are those that focus on the black community and understand sexual assault. And it's important for you to identify who, they, who those are. Programs such as Sasha Services in Michigan that understand the context of the community, Black Women's Blueprint in New York, and Ujima, the National Center on Violence in the Lives of Black Women. It's important to partner with those organizations as they can provide comprehensive support to the survivor. And you can make what we call in the field a warm referral, which means that you're connecting the survivor to an agency and to resources that you know of yourself. It's important to go beyond the book of resources and make a call, make a connection, know who the organizations are, 
know the kind of services that they provide so that you're familiar with the staff and you can easily call on them to support. Next slide. What we also know is one of the gaps in communities is that we don't have as many organizations that we would like to that are for the black community and that can respond to the black community. And so if in your community you're reaching out and you are not able to identify a organization that provides services for the black community, particularly one that addresses sexual assault, please reach out to the National Organization of Sisters of Color Ending Sexual Assault. We do have a resource list on our website, which I've listed here, that lists culture civic organizations addressing sexual assault and will list those black communities, um, those organizations that specifically work with the black community and can work with black women. In addition, please reach out to organizations like Ujima because they can also assist you in identifying resources for black women in your community. Thank you, Umi. Thank you so much, Condencia Braid. We really appreciate that the information and definitely all of the referrals that organizations will be able to follow up with. Um, whether you're in private practice or you are a nonprofit or for-profit organization, these organizations can help work with you as you're working and partnering together to ensure that the, um, the safety of survivors of sexual harassment, and sexual violence. I want to do a check-in now to see if Kelly uh, has joined us. Was Kelly able to get back on the webinar? I did. I apologize. I got kicked off. My internet has been problematic today, so hopefully it will yeah, keep me on. We, yeah, we figured that was what happened, so things always work out. It's, it's <laughs> fine. So <laughs> Kelly is going to bring a presentation to us and talk about representation for Black women survivors as an attorney. So Kelly, thank you. <laughs> thank you, and again, I apologize that I uh, got dropped there for a little bit. Um, I wanted to talk to everyone about representing uh, women, Black women survivors as an attorney and kind of what do you do from the moment when the woman walks into your office and kind of walk through what you should be considering and, and what you can expect um, and how to best handle it. This is obviously an extremely sensitive area. Um, we've just heard a lot about the trauma and how they deal with it. And when they're walking into your office, they have, you know, they're probably still processing the trauma, but they're getting ready to expose themselves even in a greater fashion, right? Because now they're going to go ahead and open themselves up to the legal system, to the judge, to, you know, the EEOC, to potentially down the line depositions, kind of reliving it, having their lives picked apart. So. There is a lot of uh, fear, there's a lot of concern, there's probably a lot of anger, and there's just, just a lot of emotions that uh, they will be feeling. And, um, you know, you just really have to kind of take a step back. And I think the first thing is to look at it in the historical context that we have been so lucky to hear so much about and get so much great information about on these two webinars. Um, and I just want to kind of go back to what Ms. Lovelace said a little bit. When you think about, for example, black women and sexuality, and you think about these stereotypes, and so you kind of think of how did how did they get here? And you know, an example may be if you get a woman, a black woman who comes in and she's you know maybe in her 60s, very happy, seen as kind of the, a mother figure of the office, and would go back to the stereotype of the mammy. And the idea is, you know, what has this person been harassed, or you know, could she be harassed? And again, you have to think back to her own concerns and uh, how, how she's being viewed. And, and these are the kinds of things, this historical context that, that plays into, you know, whether someone will come forward and how they will be viewed when they come forward. Similarly, you think about the idea of the Jezebel. Maybe you've got a woman who is, you know, known for dressing sex, and what some may consider sexually, um, or in, in, in the workplace. Maybe she wears short skirts or maybe she's worn, you know, lower court dresses or things like that. So then again, you have to think about the historical context of that and the way the stereotype has been and then her own concerns about how she's been perceived. Did she do anything to kind of encourage it? Um, you know, another example again is a sci-fi. And it's so interesting that how relevant these stereotypes are today because these do play into the, I believe, sometimes the level of guilt someone may feel. Did they contribute something? And again, how they are viewed at. So you've got you know, someone who may be tough and, 
you know, maybe the note is angry or loud, and the idea is, oh, no one would harass that person because, you know, look at her, she's tough, or she she's loud, and, you know, that, that just wouldn't happen. So you kind of have to be able to understand the history of how Black women have been viewed so you can understand when they come in and what their particular issue is, maybe what role that's playing in their, their uh, situation, their circumstances, and their experiences. Another thing that you want to think about is, you know, again, I think we've, we've talked about this a little bit, but the criminal justice history of just treating Caucasian perpetrators and victims differently than those of color. So that's an, another consideration and something that's weighing in the back of her mind is, you know, for example, what if the perpetrator is Caucasian? Then she's thinking, is my story going to be believed historically? Not the case. Um, or again, as the victim, is is someone going to feel sorry for me? Are they? Is a jury going to feel sorry for me and believe that you know I'm entitled to, um, you know, am I am I entitled to something for what's happened? And again, you have to think about that in a historical context of what we've seen throughout the times and how that plays into the fear or the concerns or what's going through the woman's head when she's making a decision about coming forward. Um, and the last kind of uh, historical context that you might want to think about is just, for example, if the perpetrator is a black man, then, and I've seen this a lot of times with, you know, women who've come, black women who've come into my office and they, they, you know, feel hesitant because they don't want to, you know, hold their black men down in the community. They've been told to, you know, to raise their black men up. And so now it's this concern of, well, am I, you know, am I now part of the problem? Am I holding this man back, even though he's, you know, harass me, even though he's done something unlawful, there's just still in this back of the mind and historical context of, you know, we need to support our own. So a lot of times I've seen that come into play and cause some trepidation about whether someone wants to come forward or whether they want to pursue it. Because again, this feeling of, I don't want to get, you know, a black man in trouble. I don't want to make anything harder for them than things that they already have. So right from the bat, you need to kind of think about these things and where they're coming from so you can better understand, um, what it took for them to get there and kind of where where they are going and, and where their head is at. Once you kind of have that context in your mind, the biggest, most important thing I can say is just making sure that they feel heard. I have had so many women come to me and say, you know, I have gone to other attorneys and I just didn't feel that, uh, you know, they believed me or that they heard me or that they took the claim seriously. And again, when you think about the historical context, this is where all of those fears kind of come into play if, you know, they, they don't feel that they've been heard, women don't feel that they've been heard. So I mean, building trust is essential because, you know, as I mentioned before, you can be talking about some very highly sensitive issues. I mean, level of sexual harassment cases that I've seen have spread from, you know, can go anywhere from offensive language to assault to, uh, you know, someone's penis being rubbed in someone's face. I mean, it's, it's, it's uncomfortable, it's traumatic, and the, you really need to have the woman's trust to make sure that she feels that she's in a safe space to be able to communicate with you what happened and also to feel like you're going to advocate for her. So, again, just making sure that they, they feel heard and built that trust and, and believe. I mean, it's, this is not a job, I think, for you to represent black women or any survivors if you can't believe survivors. So obviously that, that should have probably been the first. Is you need to go into this with the idea that I'm going to believe survivors. And I'm obviously not saying that you put on complete blinders to, you know, gaping holes or things that are just clear inconsistencies. But at the bottom, you know, at the root of this, you have to be in this to be able to believe them and to advocate for them and to try and make their stories whole because there is no perfect victim. Right, so there's always going to be something that's going to be used against that woman, and and she knows this, and you have to be there to to support and to use, you know, what you've learned in your legal experience um, to still be able to advocate on her behalf. The next thing I would say is avoiding shame and blame. You know, now when they come in, particularly for you know in those early days when they're kind of getting to know you and getting comfortable telling their story, now is not the time to you know try and say, well, what did you do to cause this issue or to, to blame them? Because again, I mean, you're already fragile. They're already, you know, nervous about the system. Most people going into the legal system for whatever, even if it's a breach of contract, are uncomfortable because they're unfamiliar with the system. So when you are talking about something as deeply personal as sexual trauma or sexual harassment, 
um, you know, you can just multiply that by a lot. So you definitely need to be careful. And and I, I think that most people don't intend to do it, but you just need to be very careful of, you know, your questioning and, and what you're, you're asking to make sure that you are not uh, making the survivor feel as though she's being blamed or that she did any anything wrong. That said, you need to, to balance that with honesty about the merits of the case and the limits of the justice system. Um, I, I think a lot of times um, you, uh, it's, it's difficult because the remedy that people want or need is often not there. And that's just, just the reality of the case. Um, the trauma that someone feels is often hard to put into numbers and it's very often not put into a number that really will make them feel satisfied. I mean, sometimes you do get these great judgments, sometimes you do get these great settlements, a lot of times you don't. So it's very important just to be honesty, to be honest about you know the, what their merits of the case are and without again blaming, but saying, look, this is what the legal system allows. This is you know what you look like you're able to prove. Uh, this is kind of where you are. Um, and just being honest about what what you can get from a jury, what you think that you know you can get from the administrative judge. Um, also being honest about what what's ahead of them. What does litigation mean? Explaining you know this is what the deposition is going to be like. These are the kinds of questions they're going to ask you about your personal life. These are the issues that they're going to raise. Are you comfortable and are you ready to talk about that? Uh, and I I don't do that to scare people away, but I also want to make sure that they know what they're getting into and that they're comfortable and that they're they're ready for what could be some very difficult periods throughout the course of the case. Um, which kind of goes into my last idea or last suggestion is how to ask the difficult questions. So I've said this a couple of times and I keep kind of going back to it, but this is just such a sensitive area of law and it's such a sensitive topic. So for example, you know, I've had cases where there is an allegation of a sexual relationship with a supervisor, um, and it's been one where this, there's an allegation of oral sex and kind of a quid pro quo situation. So there's just no easy way to talk about something that's so personal with someone you don't know, someone who's just you know come into your office. But you have to you 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 have to ask those questions. You're not going to be able to evaluate the case. You won't be able to find the right strategy, you won't be able to effectively advocate if you dance around, you know, these difficult questions. Uh, and just the way to do it is just to be straightforward and just to say, here's what I need to know from you. These are the questions that you'll be asked. This is what's necessary to, to prove your case. Um, so I need to talk to you about these things. Um, you know, showing sensitivity with the records and documents that you'll come into contact with. You know, for example, if there's graphic text messages or if there's emails, again, just showing sensitivity around that and then and then your conversations and at all times just acknowledging that this is not an easy process and I think if you do this kind of work and you have a lot of cases I think maybe we get a little bit numb to it because we you have to to some degree to be able to continue to do it but also because we have seen a lot and so maybe for us a case that we've seen you know the person who comes in today doesn't seem like it's as bad or you know as dramatic, but you have to remember for everyone for for each person that comes in there, it's all very traumatic. So um, I think that's also a really important one is just making sure that you ask difficult questions, but ask them respectfully at all time and doing all these things, believing the survivors, you know, avoiding the shame, being honest about the merits of the case, and you know about what the limits of what the justice system can do, and just carefully asking the difficult questions will ultimately um, help you be able to best advocate for the client. Um, and, and a lot of it is honestly just listening. Um, this is, you know, I feel like in all aspects of uh, legal practice, a lot of times you kind of end up feeling like a therapist because a lot of times there's venting sessions, but I feel so more so in, in this area than not, uh, obviously not suggesting anyone try to be therapist and advise, but there is a lot where of times where they just kind of need to to talk it out and, and that's other things that helps building that trust is giving them that space to to hear what they need to say and to hear what they need to get off their chest so um, I think that is also important and once you can build up the trust then I think that's the best way to be able to make sure you have the story correct be able to fill in the gaps where you need to because again there's no perfect story there's always going to be 
you know, something that's problematic for your case, but you just need to have their trust so you can know all that up front so they'll feel comfortable telling you the parts where maybe they don't come off that great so you don't find that out, you know, later on in discovery. Just making sure that you've built that trust. Um, and I think those are what I would recommend as kind of the best tips on representing uh, black women survivors. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, information. And we all recognize the difficulty it is for to engage in the civil and criminal le legal justice system for survivors uh, in the black community. And so I think that information was very, very good and well stated to assist in identifying those culturally specific ways that we can work with women in the black community who are going through these things. So thank you once more. Appreciate that. And um, next we'd like to hear Umi. from yes. Mm -hmm. Can I Umi, can I interject one one I just want to add one thing to what Kelly said, please? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I just can wanted to um you know, highlight, you know, as Kelly, yes, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. I just wanted to highlight as, as um, Kelly talked about the, um, that oftentimes when you have to, you know, ask survivors to give um, a lot of details and, you know, be, be direct in your questioning, I just want to be able to lift up, this is why it is so important to have an advocate that's with that's able to be with you and support the survivor um, and to be able to explore you know having someone that can as you are asking for the survivor to share that information someone that can be there as, as you're doing the questioning that and focused on doing those questionings that can also be there for the survivor so I, I just wanted to be able to lift that up thank you no, thank you very much. I think that was very important because, as we know, in retelling the story many times as survivors have to do, each time it's possible for them to be triggered and to go into uh, a traumatic situation and therefore not be able to really tell her story in an effective way. And so having someone there to assist, to support that she knows is a, a key element and um, being able to ensure that we're getting um, the best information that we can from her to be able to make the case as viable as possible. I appreciate your interjection with that. And speaking of uh, telling her story or her story and what it means and in the context of that, how do we present it um, from a culturally specific way such that we are not um, looking to trigger the survivor but making sure that the, her reality is being stated in a very profound way. We have Ray Mitchell joining us. And Ray Mitchell is a lawyer, a writer, an executive producer, uh, and an intellectual property strategist. And so I think all of those things combined then makes it um, a great opportunity for, uh, for survivors to understand then the relevance of how to tell her story in a way that's going to be effective. So Ray, would you like to do your presentation now, please? Sure, um, and thank you for having me um, participate in this very important conversation. I have about 10 minutes of your time today. And while this subject is very far reaching, I want to spend my uh, time talking about the, the notion of storytelling. I wanna address the questions in the headline, how and why to use public relations in the media. And, <clears throat> and I'll try and give you as many tips and hacks as I can, uh, can during this conversation. And afterwards, I will make myself available if people have questions either online or offline. So the start, the, the start of the story is about storytelling, which is essentially an art and a skill. And when we look at it, there are really three components that I would like you to keep in mind. Uh, number one is you're part of the story, your client is part of the story, and then the story is the story. So what I'm going to do is really break these three components down with some important tips. Number one, when we think about you as part of the story, there are three things you should keep in mind. There are more, but three things. Number one is it's imperative that you know and understand your rules of professional conduct covered by your bar and the court if you're involved in litigation. 
you do not want to undermine your per, your effectiveness for your client when you have these uh, these rules and regulations. So keep that in mind when you think about public relations and the media. The why and how you would want to be involved in it is there are several parts. Number one, you want to be able to strategically use public relations and the media as a way to a have your client feel that she or he is better heard and being heard. Oftentimes justice looks like somebody just being able to tell their story and using public relations and the media is a way of satisfying that justice requirement. So you don't want to get in the way of that part of justice if you run into professional conduct issues, et cetera. The second component involved in you as a part of this dynamic is understand your own brand reputation and do a brand audit. What are you bringing to the conversation so that you're not bringing noise or distraction from your client or your client's story? Uh, a lot of times, particularly in the legal profession, we don't spend as much time as we could understanding what is our brand and our brand reputation out there. And I would highly recommend that you do an online audit to see what your brand reputation looks like so that you'll know where you have leverage and you'll know where you need to uh, cover challenges because you don't want the story to shift from the client to something about you. A couple of other points, if you have time in your busy schedule, I highly recommend that you get some form of media training. Being able to be ready for the media is an important part of your persuasiveness and your ability to capture the moment. And part of that being ready for the media is cultivating media relationships on a long haul, not simply on a case by case basis. Because for you to be a valuable asset, you're looking at what would the media want if they had to make that call to get to an expert like you. So think ahead, think ahead of what's your story. Think ahead, even if you had a press kit for yourself and the work you do in general, preparedness is probably the key for being a part of this conversation about you and the art of storytelling. There are other tips that I would add, but the most important part is know that you can be an important contributor to how the message is shaped. So I wanna turn now to part number two, which is the client. The client is a very important part of this conversation, obviously. And what you're gonna to have to assess before you even talk about a media or a public relations strategy is, where is your client on this issue? It sounds like that's obvious, but it's important. Some people are not able to be in the spotlight, either because they can't control what they say or because they're not comfortable with it. So before you can even contemplate a media or a public relations, public relations strategy, you have to really understand your client. Where is she? Where is she going? What would she be comfortable with? That also includes doing some vetting and investigation of your client because you don't want to run into her social media or her brand reputation issues that could derail a very productive interview in, in less than five seconds. So it's important to know where the client stands, what assets they bring, what baggage they may bring as well. And that would also drive what sort of public relations or what sort of media you might utilize. Um, knowing whether the client can sustain being a part of an interview. Are they going to go rogue and start talking about things that you didn't agree to talk about? Are they going to come across as the angry black woman, which could undermine the, the story and narrative that you're trying to convey? So it's really important that you know which of your clients would be a part of telling that story. And once again, if there's some means to have that person get some preliminary media training, it would be highly valuable. And obviously the time you put into this is driven by 
what you're trying to accomplish with this as part of your, your component. But once again, it's a long-term relationship with the media. And you might want to keep that in mind so that as your client goes through her journey, you'll want to think about those milestones and those moments where you can um, have the spotlight turn to her experience. And I want to talk about the storyline and then I'll kind of talk about some general hacks and conclusions. I think I have about three to five, four minutes left. No, you're the fine. Part, oh, okay, good. Thank you. The other mm -hmm. part is the story. And think about the story as the hook, the, the inviting message. And when you think about messaging, it's imperative that you think about messaging from the perspective of the media and the target audience. What do they want to hear? Not so much what do you want to tell them? That becomes important because that's how you will draw them into the story. And it'll be, sometimes it's not as obvious as it appears, sometimes it is. But be willing to come into this conversation with the media and public relations from an unexpected avenue. And some of the ways you can do that is be on the lookout for nationalizing, taking national storylines and making them local. And that's a really good opportunity to build your relationship with local media. Uh, when there's a story happening in New York, but you're in Los Angeles, if you can become a go-to person that would make that story relevant, that's how the local media will start to recognize you as a value-added source. And so your client's story may be ready to go and something happens in the national media, that might be the moment that you can make that outreach to your connections that you've been developing through local media. So keep that in mind for opportunities to fit your story in. The other way that you can fit the story in is to take something local and reverse engineering it, engineer it and make it something national. Uh, the way that might work is you would think of the inevitable small, small story, but if you find a way to make it appear that it's part of a national phenomenon or something that's really relevant, that this too can happen to everybody, even if they're in, if your story's in Los Angeles, how can you make your story relevant to somebody in rural Nebraska? And if you do that, that's how you start to pick up a national carrying of your story. And another point that I want to add in terms of media and public relations is that you want to think of ways in which you can connect across unexpected channels. Now you have an unexpected story. Think about unexpected channels. For example, doing this great seminar, we've talked a lot about the emotion and the trauma and, and the stress um, on Black women as survivors and, and part of this process. Think about places like in health and wellness magazines and seminars and conversations and posts where you can talk about that angle as a part of bringing attention to your case, even though you don't want to be focusing on the legal aspects, you want to speak about the human part of it. So that's a space where you might have some unique uh, positioning. Another place is to think about cultivating relationships with some bloggers and others that are out there. These days, everybody has a podcast. Search out some high influence podcasts as well as some medium range influence. They're always, always looking for prospective candidates for interviews and conversations. And if you make yourself available on these small platforms, you will have lots of conversation points to follow up on. So don't just limit your thinking to the big, the big networks or cable or you know, the big print. Getting the story started is what's more important than getting it out to, to be a featured story in the New York Times. And that also helps with part one of our conversation, which is about you. If you become a reliable source, of relevant information, 
eventually when a big story breaks, the media is going to seek you out. I wanna also add, don't ignore some of your social media. Posting in LinkedIn is a great way to write your own story without having permission from any journalist or any other outlet. You could also use Facebook Live so that when there's a milestone in your case, do a live, do something live. For example, say you've gotten to, you've reached the point where you're ready to do the filing on this important case. Do a, a, a live broadcast. I'm going to the courtroom now. I'm filing this case. On Facebook, live broadcasts will get disseminated more through the Facebook network than a pre-recording posted. So keep that in mind, but think about ways in which you keep people involved in your story. Instagram uh, is another way in which you can do an Instagram post. And when you think about all the ways in which social media is working, what you're really doing is coming up with a guerrilla marketing PR and media plan so that you're keeping your subject and or your client with her permission at the forefront of conversations. If she's really well-groomed in speaking and being comfortable, you'll wanna measure what she says, obviously, because you don't want anything used against her in the course of her litigation, but she can speak about other things. She can speak on a topic unrelated to her experience, but nonetheless, draws attention, positive attention to her. And that's how then people will say, oh, well, what's your story? And then you can go from there. And the example would be if your person is into fitness and wellness and um, she runs a 5K marathon, she may comment on running the 5K or running the marathon was her way of dealing with the stress and the uncertainty of workplace harassment. And so she's linked something that she finds enjoyable with this challenging issue. And now that's a social media commenta uh, commentary and a post. So in summary, there are tons of ways in which you can use media and public relations, but I want you to think about the strategy before you do anything. And it's a constant focus on what will this tool do for me in terms of building your credibility with the media. Number two, always monitoring how your client is doing, responding and reacting. And number three, think about all the different ways you can use storytelling to bring attention to your issue without it necessi without necessarily focusing on just the legal aspects. There, there are lots of varieties of ways to bring attention and then draw to the storyline. And that would be all I would have to add on this issue. Thank you very much. I think you added a lot, Ray. So we really appreciate um, the information that you have presented. And it's so true, I think over the course of time, we have really seen how the media has been very important in getting justice for survivors. And um, this is, I think we started to really notice this a long time ago um, in the advocacy world as cases came forth with women being sexually assaulted and murdered and harmed in many different ways. And, the media's lack of attention or the media's attention to it could have helped or harmed survivors in so many ways. And so knowing how to work with the media, how to tell the story is a very important factor. And as we talk about that then, and how to tell the story, but also how the legal system and other institutions have worked with survivors, have they gotten it right? Or are there some things that they need to figure out ways to correct on that? Jeribo, could you comment on that for me? Yes, and I was also going to high five Ray in her presentation and share a quick funny story about how we were interviewed by Associated Press regarding the SKN case that 
uh, was funded by the National Women's Law Center, Time's Up. And so we did an interview and lo and behold, the interview was put out there in the market and ended up in the New York Times, uh, the Washington Post had it, Boston Globe, Clarion Ledger, my paper, Clarion Ledger, had my big head spread across the front page of the paper. And my uh, opposite counsel filed ex parte at first, and it was rejected by the court, a motion to seal and gag me. And when he finally got it right and refiled it, it was denied. The motion was denied and there were no sanctions levied against us, but he was in such a frenzy and it whipped up such a frenzy. I believe that that was part of how we were able to let leverage uh, the outstanding relief that we got for our client just weeks before we were scheduled to go to trial. So I think I think it's it's a it's kind of a mixed bag because certain circuits, certainly in Mississippi, they don't really like it when you try your case in the media, but this was not that type of a situation, although he accused us of that, the courts actually didn't buy it. So I think it's really important to to weigh that against where you're located and the hostility that it might bring from the bench or the friendly attitude that it might bring from the bench as well. But the story is important, so important anyway. And we were able to tell SKN's story. We were able to get her out there, even though we did not um, we did not in any way exploit her story or try to try the case in the media. We were able to talk about the plight of black women, women who are vulnerable and how the laws have not caught up to ways that they should be provided you know, with adequate and just relief. So I cite that as just an example. I don't think the legal system has caught up. I think because of patriarchy, I think because of sexism, because of racism, because of classism, I think the system is really, really backwards in terms of the types of relief that women do deserve and other victims of sexual harassment do deserve. But I think what we have to do is continue to explore all options to be as creative and brave as we can be and load up on skills and do, do the research to fight some of these battles in our in our district, the Fifth Circuit does not allow you to sue multiple defendants. And we sued multiple, de multiple defendants in the SKN case. And we were advised that the case was not gonna end in summary judgment. So that meant that we were gonna go forward with four other defendants in addition to the company. So I think you just have to step out there, do the research and then challenge in terms of policy, challenge in terms of the law itself and not just accept that the, the trend might be that none of these culprits can be brought to justice. So yeah, the legal system has a long way to go to catch up. And I find as a lawyer, I find as a civil rights lawyer and human rights defender that it is so important to use all the tools in our arsenal to lift up human rights themes. We were able to do that in a race case where we lifted up CERD and they didn't dismiss it because they didn't know what to do with it, although they dismissed the 13th Amendment. So it's just critical that we not rely on the present posture of the legal system, that we push the envelope. Mm. Thank you for those. Uh... For, the, for those thoughts and particularly also thank you for that example that you gave to us provided for us on the media in the case that you were working on and kelly could you give us some insight also about how you think the legal system and other institutions as well may have gotten some things right and also gotten some things wrong yeah, sure. So one thing I, I do think that at least they're trying to get right is I think that the EEOC is becoming more and more accessible uh, with being able to file complaints online. I think the process is, you know, at least getting a little bit clearer. So at least for people who don't have access to um, to an attorney are at least getting an opportunity to, to start the process of being heard. Not that, you know, a lot happens with the EEOC, but I, I do think that that's a move in the right direction. For me, what I would really like to see, and I think that would would really start to to make a change, is just uh, more diversity on the bench and on the administrative judges, on federal benches, state level benches, uh, everywhere. I think 
I, as I see in my own cases, um, you know, for example, I have an uh, administrative judge right now uh, on a sexual harassment case, and I've got the opposing counsel who is a very dismissive male who has been dismissive of this case from the very beginning. And I, I think that when you've got a more diverse bench, and I'm not saying, oh, if you have a woman, she'll understand or anything like that, but the nuances, the overtones, the, the allied things that happen that, you know, someone without a diverse experience, someone without, or at least someone who isn't, a, someone who's aware of historical context, someone who is aware of these, you know, smaller details that are important to a case but may not be acknowledged by uh, someone without the experience. I, I just think that can make such a difference, um, at least on getting a better shot at being heard and having a better shot of, um, you know, being able to, to prove your case if you just had a, a more diverse bench. So I'm always such a proponent of encouraging everyone, you know, around me. I know so many great um, black attorneys, black women attorneys, and that just every time an opportunity opens up, I'm like, hey, you know what? There's a spot on this bench. You should go for it. You should go for it. Because I think that if we can really make an effort and really start changing the shape of the bench to reflect what the country actually looks like, you can have people up there who can be more attuned to some of the finer details of this case. So you don't only have cases where, you know, the, the harassment was so blatant that you can't look away. But some of these other, you know, as as the world changes and as the way that people express sexism, as the way they express discrimination, uh, as that changes, people who are attuned to that. So that's, for me, something that I would like to see and I think would be a move in the right direction. Thank you very much. And Karma, could you add to some of that information? Sure, and I, I would echo um, um, just the idea that there would be more diversity on the bench. I think also um, when you look at the number of prosecutors uh, or percentage of prosecutors that are um, individuals of color or women, the numbers are extremely low. Um, something like 95% of prosecutors are actually white. And so having um, individuals who understand the complexities of um, individuals of color in this in this country are particularly important. Um, I think from an advocacy perspective, opportunities like this where um, you have the the um, the opportunity to engage with um, the system and to provide some training um, around the realities of intersecting or interacting with um, the criminal legal system for black women, um, the realities of trauma and how they sh how that shows up um, in the lives of black women. I know um, organizations like um, um, the National Organization of Sisters of Color Ending Sexual Assault and Tanya's organization there at the Women of Color Network and you, Umi, and Ujima all provide um, training and technical assistance for um, judges and attorneys as well. And so having more opportunities to engage with um, the criminal legal system to talk about things like implicit bias, to um, really explore and be able to address issues as they relate to over incarceration. Um, and also for me, from a policy perspective, to really look at, you know, what are we doing from a policy lens to ensure that there's accountability um, from the bench to the legal system so that one of the realities that we know for survivors is that there has to be follow-up, right? That you can't continue to engage with a system that um, that really uh, has been harmful for a community and say that this is the only option available as it relates to justice. Thank you very much for that as well, uh, Karma. And Tanya, I, I would like to ask you a little bit about the issue of um, diversity, of ethnicity of black women. In our conversations before, we've talked about the fact that the black community is very, very, very diverse. Uh, and eth ethnically wise, then, we're looking at black women who may be um, citizens of the U.S. or may be, have an immigration status. And have you found ways that we need to have stronger advocacy or recognize that that exists as well? It seems that a lot of times when we talk about immigrant women, we're talking about either Latinos or we're talking about Asian women. But we do have black women um, who are outside of identifying as Latino as well. So could you talk a little bit about 
how we need to support that population. Absolutely. And Umi, you made the point I was just going to make. I think that the misconception is that immigration only applies to non-Black people. And that is not true, that African immigrants, immigrants from, ha from Haiti and other places were actually directly targeted well before the most current targeting that's happening. Um, these communities have been dealing with um, with border issues and well, not some, well border issues, but also mostly dealing with uh, with larger immigration and um, and asylum issues for for decades. And so uh, and so it's it, it, it's important for us to recognize um, black and um, and African people from that lens. I think it's important for uh, for there to be a ho more holistic approach to immigration law in general. Um, that ensures that we're talking about and talking to and with um, African immigrants. And uh, again, I think that there are a number of uh, national organizations that can be reached out to. Um, again, you know, the um, Ujima and um, CSA and, um, and Women of Color Network Inc. and other groups that can provide support around that. And, and but, but, but mostly what we can do is ensure that we put you in touch with groups and individuals who are specifically addressing immigration. Um, and there are local programs and community groups that are doing immigration work and who often, and specifically those that are working with African immigrants that get very, very little support and very, very little um, recognition. And so I would say that it's important to, um, to center um, African folks within the context of immigration and to, again, as all of the women have stated so far, so far to reach out to the resources because we're definitely here to help. Thank you, Tanya. And, you know, just going one step beyond that, we've talked about um, about judges, we've talked about lawyers and uh, advocates, but what about the jurors that come in for cases where there are jury trials? What, how is it that I, I've had the opportunity to do court watch on numerous cases and sometimes I'm just amazed and astounded by some of the verdicts that come in based on the, the vision or the knowledge of the, the jurors themselves. Condencia, could you add anything to that? And Kelly, could you add something to that? Um, I'll let Kelly go first. Mm -hmm. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I think I cut out for like the last four minutes. So can you just repeat it and then I'm happy to, um, my internet is just going in and out right now. So can you, can you repeat that for me? Not a problem, Kelly. I was just asking about the response of jurors. And sometimes to me, as I sit in on cases, it just seems like they get it really wrong. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about your experience in the courtroom and the knowledge of jurors or how do we help to increase their information regarding the dynamics of sexual assault and sexual harassment? Sure. So I can speak to, um, I haven't had sexual harassment jury cases, but I, I've had uh, breach of contract and other jury cases. And just in general, the juries often get it wrong. And I've actually won. And then speaking with the jurors afterward, <laughs> realized that I'm not even clear how I did, because they certainly didn't, wasn't based on the theories that I put forth. But, you know, I'm not <laughs> not going to look the gift horse in the mouth. So, you know, I, I think that's tough because you, you just don't know what you're going to get until you get to, you know, until you start choosing. So there's, until you're selecting the jury. So there's no kind of way in advance to educate. You just have to really make sure that through your presentation of your case that you put on, you know, the evidence that they need to educate them. That's whether that's through getting it through experts or whether it's getting it through testimony. But I mean, your opportunity to try to educate them about the sexual, about sexual assault, about the trauma, I mean, it's it's actually kind of the same with the with the judge. I mean, your your opportunity to educate them is that's your your duty. First of all, you have to assume that you know they they don't know and that they don't understand, and you have to make sure that you have compelling uh, testimony, compelling witnesses who can explain in a persuasive way what exactly these women are going through, what the trauma does to them, um, and, and particularly when you're getting into you know emotional. Uh, 
and damages and things of those nature when you're getting into, you know, having the expert testify about, um, you know, what that particular witness or what that particular plaintiff has gone through. It's just really, it really is important to make sure that you've got someone who can persuasively explain, you know, just the devastation and the damage that uh, results from these trauma because I think that you're, what you're saying is very right. They they don't get it and you can't assume they're going to get it and you can't assume just from, you know, your, your client telling the story they'll get it. A lot of times it needs to be from, you know, different voices and people that the jury say, oh, this person knows what they're talking about and they're saying that, you know, this is the kind of things you can expect from trauma and I think that's just the best way to educate um, as far as doing it in advance, I, I don't know of any way, but just through the course of presenting your case, you have to make sure that you put people on who can, uh, you know, make sure that they do educate the jury on the different aspects of sexual assault. Thank you very much. And Condensia, I had called on you as well, but I have to apologize. It is 4.30 and it's time for us to end our webinar. And so um, if you have some comments that we can add to the inbox for the webinar, we'll make sure and do that as well. So sorry that I didn't get back to you. But I'd like to thank all of our participants for joining us on this webinar uh, as the Legal Network for Gender Equal Equity webinar series. It's part two on Black women survivors of workplace sexual harassment and sexual violence. And we'll be having other things that are coming up in the future. We'll keep you aware of those things. I'd like to say thank you to all of our presenters who did an astounding job in giving the information going from the historical context all the way to current day issues that are happening in our communities and in our legal systems, criminal and civil legal systems. So thank you very much for joining us and I wish you all a very good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm signing off now. <laughs>